A.W. Tozer said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Psalm 139, 1 through 6 says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You searched out my path, my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. We're talking about this attribute of God known as omniscience. That is that he is all-knowing. Omni, of course, meaning all, and then science, where we get our word science, uh, which is the, is the idea of the word knowledge. So having all knowledge, having all possible knowledge. Uh, it's, it's another one of those attributes that's so staggering to us that it's hard for us to comprehend what it means that God knows all, what it means that God indeed knows everything. The magnitude of this idea is really too much for us to grasp. A.W. Pink said he knows everything, everything possible, everything actual, all events and all creatures of the past, the present, and the future. He is perfectly acquainted with every detail in the life of every being in heaven, in earth, and in hell. Timothy George says he has comprehensive knowledge of all that was and ever shall be. Wayne Grudem says God fully knows himself and all things actual and possible in one simple and eternal act. Yeesh. Job 37. Do you know the balancings of the clouds? The wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge. Psalm 147. Great is our Lord, abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Proverbs 15, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Matthew 6, your father who sees in secret will reward you. John 21, Peter said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Hebrews 4, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. 1 John 3, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Epistemology is the study of how we come to know something. Right? Not just the study of knowledge, but the study of how we come to know something. God does not come to know in the same way that we come to know. Right? Think about any fact that you know. Just pick a random fact. Think about any fact you know. Now, how do you know that? Right? At some point, you came to that knowledge through some avenue, whether it be reading a book, someone told you that fact, uh, you observed that fact with your eyes, and so you came to that knowledge, you observed that fact with your ears or some other part of your senses. That's the way we come to know things, right? We are presented with things and we ascertain them. God doesn't know that way. God just knows. He, he didn't discover anything, right? We discover things as we get older. We come to know things. God has never come to know anything. He has just always known. He just knows and always has known. James P. Boyce says there is in God... Nothing corresponding to observation, comparison, generalization, deduction, or processes of reasoning by which we pass from one step to another. His knowledge is not something acquired, but something belonging to that nature itself and identical with it. Mm. Right, that we come to knowledge, we gain knowledge, we ascertain certain things. God has never done that. He has always simply and eternally known all things. Uh, and Boyce talks about us moving from one step to the other. That's how our minds work, right? We talk about trains of thought, and sometimes something, something will pop in our heads, and we think, how did I get there? And you try to follow back your train of thought that led you from one point to the other. Right? We think linearly. We think from point to point. Our, our minds go from this to that to that to that. And we can quickly go from, you know, zoo animals to movies. But there's a process that took us from the lion to 
the the guy who did Mufasa's voice in Lion King to the Sandlot to the greatest movie ever to the other great movies of all time and <laughs> whatever that would we had this train God doesn't do that right God doesn't move linearly through thinking God doesn't go from one thinking point to the other God knows everything simultaneously and, and at once so what I want to do is I want to look at a few things that God knows uh, and to, to to try to get a handle on the unhandleable, to try to wrap our minds a little bit around the thing we can't possibly wrap our heads around, which is the way that God knows. First, God fully knows God. God fully knows himself. Now, if you were to meet anyone else and, they, and, and you were to come to realize that they know everything about God, that'd be, that'd be pretty impressive, <laughs> right? Everything about the infinite one. God knows fully himself. Matthew 11. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. 1 Corinthians 2. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. God fully knows God. There's this Trinitarian perfect knowledge of the other members of the Trinity. Uh, I, I preached a fairly long series in the Holy Spirit, and we worked together, struggling and working to try to understand a little bit better about the Holy Spirit. The Father understands perfectly. The Holy Spirit understands the Father perfectly. First Corinthians chapter 2, again. No one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Uh, sometimes in my marriage with my wife, wonderful wife, um, we are one Right? That's what it is to be married. Is we, are, we are one flesh, and that means many things. Sometimes in my oneness with my wife, I fail to say things to my wife um, that I should. Right? I fail to communicate the way that I should communicate. Right? Or there's just simple gaps in knowledge where I will know something that she won't know, or that she will know something that she hasn't told me. And so we end up in life pulling against each other, um, making separate plans or handling children differently because we thought the other one was on the same page, but they weren't. Or we thought that the, that we were going to do this today, but actually the plan was to do something else. Or we communicate poorly, right? Maybe this this has never happened. Maybe we end up leaving a kid at practice because she thought I was going to get him and I thought she was going to get him. Right? Even though we're one and we're, we're unified, um, we still have lapses in communication and lapses in knowledge. With the Godhead, there are no such knowledge gaps, no such inconsistencies. There's perfect unity and understanding each other. God fully knows himself, far more fully than I know my wife or she knows me even. God's knowledge is eternal. God's knowledge is eternal. A.W. Pink says, God's knowledge of the future is as complete as his knowledge of the past and of the present. And that because the future depends entirely upon himself. Were it any wise possible for something to occur apart from either the direct agency or permission of God, then that something would be independent of God and he would at once cease to be supreme. If it was possible, Pink says, for something to happen that God didn't either cause or at least allow, then he would cease to be God. No longer infinite, no longer supreme. And just... Uh, to, to use the to, to say it again, which is one of the things that blows my mind the most, everything that God knows, which is everything, <laughs> everything that God knows, which is everything, He has known for all eternity past. There has not been a succession of knowledge, right? You and I started off in kindergarten. Then we got some knowledge, moved to first grade. Then we got some knowledge and moved to second grade. And we moved our way up academically, but more generally, and maybe more importantly, we moved our way up intellectually and in knowledge. We learned more things, so we're able to progress and move forward in knowledge. That's, in a lot of ways, the story of human life. We are, we are progressing in knowledge. With God, there was no such progression. With God, there was never, uh, uh, God has never learned anything. God has known everything from the foundation of the world, has known everything from all eternity past. Nothing ever happened where God was like, hmm, didn't know that. Interesting bit of knowledge, interesting tidbit you had there, Renee, that I didn't know. There's, God has known all things for all time, from all eternity. Isaiah 46, remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. 
I am God, there's none like me. I put here, what, what defines him as God? What is it that sets him apart? What is it that he sees here that makes him peculiarly God? Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done. That is, from the very beginning, God already could tell you what exactly was going to happen at the end and knew everything that would happen along the way. Declaring the end from the beginning. Psalm 139, even before words on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together before I even speak it. God knows it. Isaiah 42, behold, the former things have come to pass and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Before you even think of them, I'm telling you what you're going to say. Matthew 6, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. God's knowledge is eternal. When, uh, when did God learn that you would be sitting here listening to this podcast or watching this video? When did God learn that? Oh, I had no idea He was going to do that today. When did God, when did God learn that? The truth is he has known it from the very beginning that you would be here listening to this, watching this. Now, I want us to see how the answer to that question, that God has always known that, is a great blessing to us. Let's continue. God's knowledge is immediate. God's knowledge is immediate. That is, he knows everything simultaneously. He knows everything at once. He never has to calculate something to discover the bottom line, right? He doesn't have those trains of thought progressing from one thought to another. God's mind isn't so small as that. He knows everything, all things at once, having every thought at once. A.W. Tozer, again, God in one effortless act knows instantly all things that can be known. Whew. God cannot learn. And then he says, God knows all causes, all thoughts, all mysteries, all enigmas, all feelings, all desires, every unuttered secret. Because God knows all things perfectly, he does not know anything better than any other thing. But all things equally well. He never discovers anything. He is never surprised. God knows all things equally well because he knows all things perfectly. Nothing new ever enters God's mind. Nothing ever suddenly dawns on God. Nothing catches him off guard. Never has a eureka moment. He never adds to or subtracts from his knowledge. It's infinite. It is perfect. He does not know some things better than other things. He knows everything perfectly. He knows everything immediately. He knows everything eternally. He knows all things right now at once. And he's known them all at once simultaneously from the beginning. <laughs> Ugh. Romans 11, 33. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who became his counselor? Isaiah 40. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice? And who taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding? Who knew something that God didn't know? that needed to instruct God, that needed to counsel God on how he should handle a, a certain situation, needed to give God insight about things he didn't previously, previously know. No one has ever been God's informant. And, and, and when you cry out, God, help me, he doesn't respond wide-eyed with, what's going on? <laughs> right? We assume these things when we pray. We don't start our prayers and say, God, you ain't going to believe what happened today. <laughs> All right, God fully knows every aspect of his creation. Second Chronicles, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Job, for he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. Matthew 10, are not two sparrows sold for a penny and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Hebrews 4, no creature is hidden from his sight. All are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God knows every aspect of his creation. There's nothing going on in the Amazon jungle that God is not fully aware of and that if he didn't declare it to happen, at least allowed it to happen, whatever language you're more comfortable with. God fully knows us, human folk, and all other people as well. First Chronicles 28, You, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. That's terrifying. 
and yet true. Ezekiel 11, the spirit of the Lord fell upon me and he said to me, say, thus says the Lord, so you think, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind. Psalm 33, the Lord looks down from heaven, sees the chosen of man from where he sits enthroned. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all of their deeds. This is comforting, right? Because God knows you. God knows the truth whenever there's a lie spreading about you. God knows the truth when other people are uh, deceiving others about you. God knows when, when you sacrificed for other people and no one else saw it. God knows. Right? It's comforting because God sees. And it's convicting and terrifying because God sees. Because God knows you and, and knows your real motives knows your real thoughts, knows why you did that thing, knows why exactly you said that thing, etc. Psalm 139, one of the best passages in this topic. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before words on my tongue, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. That word there used for for searched on the top. You have searched me and know me. It's the same word used for the spies that go into the land of Jericho to find out past, right? They're searching out the things that are real inside of that country, the things that are there. God is searching us out. He has done this perfectly and constantly. He says, you know when I sit down and when I rise up. Hey, that's all the time. There's no more times than those. (laughs) You know when I'm down and when I'm up. That's all the times. You know everything. You discern my thoughts from apart from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, are acquainted with all my ways. You hem me in behind and before, lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it's high, I cannot attain it. I would be uncomfortable with another person knowing me like this. Because they definitely wouldn't love me. Not if they knew me like that. And yet God does know me like that. And does love me. The most beautiful things about marriage are just uh, small pictures of the truest things about our relationship with God. The... the, uh, I've, I've, I've told a lot of young couples that are getting married that, that what you think is going to happen in marriage is you're going to see all the more flaws in the other person and then have to figure out how to love them anyway. And there, there's certainly some of that. But much more profoundly, what happens in marriage is you see many more flaws in yourself and you're astonished that this person loves you anyway. That is a picture of the reality of you and God who no matter how well your spouse knows you, knows you far better. In fact, knows you perfectly. And yet, despite knowing you that way, despite seeing those thoughts and those actions that no one else sees, still loves you more than anyone else ever has. Pink says, the apprehension, apprehension of God's infinite knowledge should fill the Christian with adoration. The whole of my life stood open to this view, uh, to his view from the beginning. He foresaw my every fall, my every sin, and my every backsliding, yet nevertheless he fixed his heart upon me. Oh, if we would see the realization of this, we would bow in wonder and worship before him. Finally, God knows every possibility. God knows every possibility. 2 Kings 13. God says, You should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it. But now you will strike down Syria only three times. God says, If you would have done it this way, things would have been different. More famously, Matthew 11. If the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago. It will be more bearable in the day of judgment for them than for you. If the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. 
But I tell you, it'll be more tolerable in the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. God knows exactly what would have happened if things would have occurred differently. God knows every possibility and takes absolutely everything into account in his perfect judging. He will take everything into account. Every reality, every possibility. And we can leave those things up to him. Now, this is a um, communicable attribute, right? That means it's one of those attributes that we have in part as, as being made in the image of God. We have, we have knowledge in part. We don't have omniscience, but we have some me <laughs> That's so stupid. We have, we have some knowledge, right? So we mirror God in that we can have knowledge, but of course, we don't have it in full. We have it only in part. Right, but he shares this attribute with us. Our knowledge is dependent upon God. Our knowledge doesn't include the future, for instance. Uh, we can't know other people's thoughts or motivations or intentions. Sometimes we don't even see our own. Our knowledge is very, very limited in scope. Um, but we have it in part. Sir Isaac Newton said, I remind myself of a little boy walking along the seashore picking up shells. The boy has a handful of shells in his little hand. But all around him is the vast seashore stretching all directions as far as the eye can see. All that I know is simply a handful of, she- of seashells. All of my knowledge, simply a handful of seashells. But the vast universe of God is filled with knowledge that I do not possess. We have some. Um, but certainly now more than ever, we think we have more than we actually do. A.W. Pick says, This attribute should lead us to pursue holiness and worship. Yet how little do we meditate upon this divine perfection? Is it because the very thought of it fills us with uneasiness? How solemn is this fact? Nothing can be concealed from God. Though he be invisible to us, we are not so to him. Neither the darkness of night, the closest curtains, nor the deepest dungeon can hide any sinner from the eyes of omniscience. This is a wonderful attribute of God that should comfort us and should convict us cause us to worship, and cause us to strive after holiness. Your view of God has grown today, I hope, as it's mine has. I love you, church. Talk to you soon. A.W. Tozer.